Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History webinar series. Um, I'm Marin, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Um, just to let you know, if you could please turn your mics and video cameras off, that would be great. Um, we want to be able to have a smooth presentation. Um, today, we are having a uh, presentation with James Tanner. Um, following that on next Thursday, um, Lisa Arnold um, uh, had to cancel her webinar. So most likely we'll have um, Joe Price on the 16th at 3 p.m. Um, that will be updated on our Facebook and our Twitter, as well as our website and our YouTube channel. Um, so if you uh, need to catch those changes, um, they'll be there as well as uh, email um, notifying you of those changes will be sent. Um, Today's webinar is Case Studies in Immigration for Genealogists. Um, James Tanner uh, has over 32 years experience in the genealogical research field and is an avid blogger for Genealogy Star Blog and Rejoice and Be Exceeding Glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 34 grandchildren and one great-grandchild. Um, if you have any technical problems or are having problems hearing the audio, um, please go ahead and use the chat box uh, for that, and I can address those problems. Um, if you have any comments or questions, you can put those in the chat box, and they'll be addressed at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. I think that's everything. I'll just turn the time over to James and we'll get started. Howdy, this is James Tanner. I'm glad to be here for another BYU Family History Library webinar. Uh, this Today we're going to talk about a, prod, a subject called case studies in migration. And this is a uh, an overview of the migration that occurred in the United States and the different influences. And one of the things that prompts this particular type of, of presentation is the uh, very, very common issue with putting people in places where there was not, there were no, where nobody lived at the time. Uh, many times uh, I see uh, particularly uh, in pedigrees and other uh, lists of, of relatives and things like that, where someone is uh, located in a location where uh, long before uh, the area was settled and uh, long before anyone uh, other than the native inhabitants of America lived there. So we're going to look and see how that happened and uh, a little bit of history here. And uh, understanding that we're what we're trying to do here is is begin the process of of looking outside of the names, dates, and places, and looking more at places than names, then and also dates, so that we have uh, some realistic assessments of how and where people lived and how they may have moved from area to area. It's also a, a really good way to get. Uh, information about brick wall situations because a lot of times, uh, at least my experience, I've found that in brick walls, they're usually looking in the wrong place about 80% of the time. So we'll uh, get into the, the idea of, uh, of migration. Uh, this is uh, uh, some of the earliest parts of the United States uh, that the area we're going to call of North America that we now call United United States of America. And uh, the colonization of North America had an impact on, uh, on the areas of the country. Uh, I'm going to get some baseline dates here. France settled in Florida, which they called South Carolina, in 1562, but they were all killed. In, 60, in 1564 by Spain when Spain took over that part of the, of the country. So from around the mid, uh, late mid 1500s, 
uh, that part of the United States that we would uh, consider to be Florida now was owned by Spain. And they settled to St. Augustine in 1565, and they tempted settlements as early as 1526. So we're, we're looking in the mid 1500s here uh, in the southern part of the United States, uh, another part of the of course of the country that was settled by Spain included the, the major portions of the western part of the United States, including California, Arizona, Nevada, uh, in, up into and including Utah, uh, New Mexico, uh, Texas, uh, and even up north or into what we would call Oklahoma and Kansas. All of these areas were claimed and settled by the, the Spanish by the Spanish Empire. England settled in Jamestown in 1607. This was the first permanent uh, settlement uh, from England. Uh, we need to remember these dates because in a sense, uh, I don't think you need to memorize dates, but you do need to know have enough uh, background in history to realize that you need to look this up if you don't know the date of when all of this occurred. Uh, Holland settled in New Amsterdam, now called New York, uh, in uh, 1624. Uh, sometimes these dates are a little surprising for people because uh, we uh, have a kind of a uh, fixed idea of settlement in the United States uh, that's, that's fixed on uh, the pilgrims coming to the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, Massachusetts area in uh, 1620. Uh, but we need to understand there was a lot going on before that, and there were a lot of other settlements. Sweden settled in New Sweden, which they now call New Jersey, in 1638. You may be surprised. I don't know how many people would realize that, that the uh, Kingdom of Sweden uh, made claim to the New World, as they called it uh, at that period of time. And Russia settled their Three Saints Bay Colony on Kodiak Island in Alaska in 1784. It was rather late in this whole process, but still uh, was a significant um, uh, issue because uh, they, uh, we had to acquire Alaska from uh, a claim by Russia and uh, in a purchase that, that was made. So these are uh, sort of the baselines for the European encroachments into, uh, into the North American area of the country. Uh, another basic point that we need to understand about the settlement of the, of the area that we now call the United States, uh, I'm not going to I, I, you have to make a distinction, obviously, you're talking about North America, and, and, and traditionally North America is, is, uh, refers to the countries of Mexico, the United States, and Canada. And so I, I'm going to focus on what we now call the United States, and obviously did not exist until after 1775 uh, and uh, actually 1782 80 to 86 in that range. Uh, we really don't have a, a, an entity called the United States. Uh, it was various colonial uh, period of time after the United States declared independence from England. Um, the important point here is this uh, idea of for sale. What we're talking about when we talk about for sale is that there are um, there are property that most of the development of our of the country we call the United States uh, came about as a result of land speculation and land sales. So the key to understanding migration patterns, just about anywhere, uh, has to do with property development and land speculation. Uh, each of the colonies from England. Uh, the Virginia colony and the Massachusetts colony and the other colonies as they uh, were established were essentially land development schemes. Uh, the king gave land to uh, the developers, the developers who were usually uh, nobility uh, were people who then uh, resold the property to their friends, who resold it to their friends, who basically then uh, sold it out to ultimately to uh, people who wanted to buy the property. 
and uh, made uh, fabulous uh, fortunes out of out of selling land that they uh, really had no historical basis for claiming and uh, claimed at the expense of the native populations. So we have, but that's, uh, if you really want to know it, is the history of our country and it's the basic history of our country. But back to this map of the, uh, of the companies, the question is how did all of these settlements influence subsequent migration? Where did these people go? How did they get there? And what were the limitations that were uh, uh, imposed by the, the geography of the United States? The differentiation here, there's a differentiation here. We're, we're talking about settlement, but we're also, and land development, we also have to take into account that there's a, a lot of the land in the United States that is not uh, easily inhabitable. Uh, we have vast deserts. I think somebody has on their, their video and their audio, so I'd ask you to check that and see if we can get that taken care of. Um, so how did those uh, settlements influence the migration and how did the geography of the land influence migration? Uh, we, we need to know the actual reality is that from 1607 to 1735, there was no road system on the East Coast. Okay, what does that really mean? It means until 1735, there were no roads. You could not travel north and south along the east coast of the United States. So when you see someone whose family uh, records uh, on, the, on one of the big uh, online websites indicates that uh, they had a child born in Georgia and they had a, uh, the rest of the children were born in Massachusetts in 1700 or 1690 or something like that. Uh, that was just simply impossible. The only possibility is that these people got on a boat and sailed down the coast. Uh, you would have to, first of all, decide how in the world they could afford that. How could they afford passage? And why would the mother uh, who was having a baby travel down to Georgia from Massachusetts, for example, to have a baby? And that, of course, brings up the first rule of genealogy, which has been around for a considerable time now. And that is when the baby was born, the mother was there. So if you have to uh, if, take into account the fact that if you put down that a child is born in a particular location, you better have some pretty good idea of how the mother got there uh, physically and uh, temporally, how, how much time it would have taken and, and what uh, travel arrangements were available at the time. So uh, what the picture here is showing is a, uh, obviously a, a path in the woods. Uh, that happens to be what they considered to be the roads at the time. Uh, if it were a little bit wider, it might have accommodated a wagon, but that uh, was not the case until around 1735. And then what began the process of uh, transportation and communication within the, the uh, uh, continental part of the United States was what we call the King's Highway. And this wasn't a one consolidated highway. It was a collection of, of short segments that were built uh, locally and then connected eventually together. And it was, uh, uh, this was the road and the main north-south road into the uh, 1770s. Okay, so at the time of the independence, the Revolutionary War and the independence, this was the only north-south communication highway in the United States. So you have to think about that over and again. If you wanted to travel north and south through the United States, for example, from Boston down to Charleston, you would need to follow on this road and a wagon road, and it was in various segments and took days and sometimes weeks and sometimes months to travel just a short distance depending on weather conditions and the time of the year and the availability of, of uh, any kind of support, meaning places to stay, uh, places to get food, all of that infrastructure that had to be created for this to actually become 
a road for transportation within the United States. So when I see dates going back into uh, the 1750s or 1730s where people have supposedly traveled great distances, I uh, am very, very skeptical that that information is, is correct and substantiated. Now, before anybody gets upset about that, of course, we, there are always exceptions. There seems to be always someone who managed to travel and uh, managed to get born someplace that was uh, uh, in an outlier situation where, there, where it was not reasonable during the time. But, but uh, by and large, most of those uh, need to be resolved in favor of the, of the travel times. Here's a, uh, a map with approximate travel times. This is in 1800. Now we're jumping forward rather quickly in time. We're cover we've covered almost 200 years, more than 200 years here of, uh, of history of people, Europeans in the, United, in the United area of the United States. And what we have is uh, the time travel. Uh, so if someone was traveling, say, from New York down to North Carolina, the fastest time that they could do if they were on a horse and they were riding as, uh, as much as you can ride a horse every day, it would be about a week. Here's a side note. This is something that uh, is interesting if you, uh, if you want to, uh, to, to have an understanding of this. Uh, perhaps you have seen uh, a movie uh, at some time in your life of, uh, of people riding horses. And generally speaking, uh, with uh, movies depicting cowboys, particularly when they were fighting Indians or when there was something else going on, or in any other situation usually, you see them galloping across the countryside on this horse, galloping, galloping, uh, rapidly going from one place to another. Here's the reality of that situation. A horse can only run on the average, about 12 miles before it stops. It's uh, kind of like it has a gas tank of only 12 miles. And if you run that horse at the end of 12 miles, you're not going any place on that horse for a long time. Now, if you want an example of this, we can fast forward to, uh, to later years. They established the Pony Express, very uh, kind of famous thing that only lasted a few months. But uh, the Pony Express stations were approximately 12 miles apart because when they galloped their horses across the desert, they had to get onto another horse in order to go any further. And so uh, the travel by horse was only slightly faster than travel by foot. Uh, obviously, you could carry more. Uh, perhaps if you had two or three horses, you could have a packs. If you had a wagon, you would still have to worry about getting your wagon through down the trails and down what they called roads at that period of time. So these are kind of approximate numbers, but it'll give you some idea of the travel time that would occurred. Okay, now we're going to kind of jump to a different subject here. We're going to talk about Vermont. Uh, one of the things that happened in, in, as I did research, is that I had a number of relatives who were living in the uh, southern part of the New England states in, in Rhode Island and Connecticut. And, and these people in Rhode Island and Connecticut, all of a sudden they show up in Vermont. And then all of a sudden they show up back in Connecticut. How did that occur? Well, the state of Vermont was part of the New Hampshire grants between 1749 and 1764. And so what that means is that people, uh, land developers went down into the southern part of the country from New York south and began the process of selling land in Vermont. And so people who uh, saw an opportunity here, who perhaps did not have land or who, want, who thought they needed more land, could buy land in uh, Vermont for a relatively cheap price. And so they packed their, their bags and they moved to Vermont between 1749 and 1764. So you'll see an influx of people into Vermont during that particular time period. And then what happened? Well, it looks pretty cold right now there in Vermont. And you'll find out that the, the growing season and the opportunities for agriculture in Vermont are nothing like they are in southern New York State or even further down in, into uh, uh, 
uh, Pennsylvania and uh, Virginia and all the way down into all the other, the other states. And it's pretty rocky. Uh, a lot of mountains and a lot of rocks. And uh, a lot of the people who moved north to Vermont because of the, free, of the low priced land picked up and went back to wherever they came from. So you can see these kinds of things, and they may not have any, make any sense at all until you begin the process of understanding the history and the background of how all of this occurred. Here's an important thing to remember. Even today, that's today, I'm talking about 2000 and whatever we're in, 19 now, that 39% of the population in counties are, lives in counties that are directly on the shoreline of the United States. Okay, so nearly half, going up 40%, almost 40%, 39% of the population lives in cities that border on the shoreline, on, excuse me, counties that border on the shoreline. Um, not just because people like to live near the ocean, which some people do, but that's the way the country develops. That's the way, that's the reality of where we live in the, in the United States. And uh, the, the population density along the shoreline is, is extremely higher. You've got to think uh, Los Angeles and all of its suburbs, San Francisco, Seattle, uh, just uh, San Diego, uh, New York, Boston, uh, Philadelphia, uh, and uh, all of the Chesapeake Bay colonies up Washington and all of those places uh, on, the, on the big Chesapeake Bay, those are all, that's shoreline. That's all direct connections to the, the ocean on down, of course, all the way down to Miami and, and uh, further. Uh, and then in Texas, uh, there's uh, some very large cities on the, on the coastline. So what we have here is, uh, <laughs> by the way, here's another side note, Arizona managed to miss the coastline because of what we call the Gadsden Purchase, uh, where there's this interesting line that goes north instead of directly west, which would have hit the Gulf of uh, Mexico. And uh, it misses the Gulf of Mexico and le leaves all of the Gulf of Mexico in Mexico. Uh, would have changed the world because Yuma could have become one of the largest cities in the United States uh, if it had been on the coast and had uh, access to the ocean. Okay, um, another thing, now we need to start thinking about the, the topography, the, the way the land lays. Uh, the reality of this in the, on the eastern seaboard in the United States is that there is a mountain range that runs from the north of Canada all the way down into the south, into Georgia, and, uh, and a little bit further down. There's uh, still rather rugged country. Uh, for those of us who live on the edge of the, the Rocky Mountains, or uh, uh, as I do on what's called the Wasatch Front in, uh, in Provo, Utah Valley here in Provo, in Provo Utah. Uh, these are mountains are not uh, all that impressive because they're, uh, you know, they, they aren't uh, as nearly as high as the mountains around here or as steep and rocky. But on the other hand, they were very, very effective barriers to transportation, particularly when the only transportation you had was either wagons drawn by horses or mules or oxen. And so, uh, that was uh, that was the major barricade, and that was an important an barricade. And each and each of the steps, and what this map map shows, is that the what we have what we call the Appalachian or Appalachian Valley, and it's the great valley that runs down between two mountain ranges. Now, what it did was it gave a north south rather much easier access along that central corridor between uh, the south and the north. And if you look at it today, you'll see there are several large uh, and a lot of settlements along that valley. And there's many places where you can cross the mountains as they, these mountain passes from east to west that were being explored. 
And so this was uh, the, the two things, the, the existence of these mountain passes and the existence of the, of, uh, the great Appalachian, Appalachian Mountains, uh, excuse me, Appalachian Valley. And it was the, uh, this, these things determined a lot of things. In fact, if, you're a, a, if you've done a lot of reading on the, uh, the American Civil War, the, you will find out that the Shenandoah Valley, which is part of this, and the other connected valleys here were important corridors for uh, north-south movements of the troops during, that war, during the war. And so part of this was also determined by the river, the rivers that uh, ran. <clears throat> and the, the central, of course, uh, drainage pattern of the United States is the Mississippi River and its subsidiaries, the Missouri River the, and uh, down in, in the Ohio River and other rivers like that. And the Ohio River became uh, one of the major ways to access of uh, that central part of the United States. And uh, the other river valleys is uh, most of the major cities in the United States uh, it, that are off of the coast are established on rivers that had either more or less uh, access to uh, the, the ocean. So you could bring boats up from the ocean and gain access to the interior. Uh, for example, uh, I was just uh, not too long ago in Augusta, Georgia, and Augusta is there on the Savannah River, and that was, uh, and it is, the city is at the point where the, there is a waterfall or rocky uh, sort of uh, rapids area in the river that was the place where you couldn't get past, and they have built locks around that uh, to go up and down the river. So you begin to realize that as time developed that these were the reasons why many of these uh, settlements across the United States <clears throat> where your, if your family came from the, uh, goes back and has history in, uh, in the United States, then this is where uh, you need to t become aware of why and how they moved and where, uh, where the industrialization began, where people could get jobs and why they moved. Um, <clears throat> so one important factor is that as a result of the Treaty of Paris, back in those wars in that time period, King James claimed the land in America. Well, basically uh, from France and uh, everyone else, he uh, simply said, we own it. And uh, of course that didn't settle all of the claims and all of the issues but that was a major factor in how uh, the, the property was divided up. <clears throat> and so if you look at this, this is the British claims. <clears throat> Before 1763, all that Britain claimed was the 13 colonies, which is the dark red on the East Coast. And then in, after that, in 1763, uh, they obtained claim to all of the sort of pink area that's an extension. And uh, from the Spanish around 1762 and 1763, um, <clears throat> the area that's outlined in green is called the Indian Reserve of 1763. And the interesting thing about that is that there was a, uh, a mandate from the British Crown that no one but the Indians could live there. So we had uh, some interesting uh, barriers here through the 1700s for uh, any, any Western expansion of the 13 colonies and uh, limitations on people. So when you start to see this and you see that people uh, are claiming to have had been born in places that we now call Tennessee and Kentucky back in the mid 1700s, you've got some real problems because uh, you've got to understand when and where these people had that. So when we call it west to the Ohio, which is the blue line uh, on the west side of the Indian Reserve and then down the Mississippi River, and uh, of course the Missouri, which by the way, at that time period had 
almost no human, no European knew that there was a river called the Missouri, or which of what eventually was called the Missouri. So when did they move off the East Coast? Well, they moved off the East Coast to Ohio on April 7th, 1788. So if you need a date, <laughs> That's the date, folks. So what does that mean? Before that date, there were no colonists who lived in Ohio. That's as simple as it could be put. So look at your genealogy and see if you have any dates with your family born in Ohio before 1788, and then start doing some history to figure out who they were and how they got there. If they were French, maybe. If they were uh American Indians or Native Americans. Uh, another side note, both terms are acceptable. And Kentucky, 1774. Literally, literally, folks, I have, I have a line on my, I still do, I still have, I like to keep it because I think it's just, it's interesting to look at. Detailing uh, settlements in that uh, trans mountain area that date back into the early 1700s in the same town, in the same county, when neither the town nor the county existed until many, many years after the supposed uh, all these people were born in that location. So unless they were born out there in the middle of the wilderness with, uh, in, a, in a cabin or whatever, uh, it's not likely that they were actually there. Tennessee adds at 1768, so a little bit earlier than Kentucky. It's kind of easier to get into Tennessee than it was to get into Kentucky, by the way. Okay, now we're going to jump here because we have some uh, developments that start to happen in the United States, and uh, they get to be pretty important as to how uh, movement started occurring away from the coast and into other areas of the country. And the major, uh, one of the most important uh, routes that occurred was the concept that it began, by the way, this is not something that happened in, in isolation. Uh, England had begun a, a massive canal building uh, effort uh, even before the idea of an Erie Canal was even conceived. But uh, in this case, we have the Erie Canal, where it broke ground in 1817. Now, you have to jump ahead and understand that they broke ground. That meant there was no Erie Canal. There was no way to go east and west. If you wanted to travel, you got on a horse or you pulled a wagon through the wilderness and spent days and days cutting down brush or trees or trying to get your wagon through. Uh, on the roads that did exist, uh, in, the, in the summer, they were in the spring and fall, they were quagmires. If you tried to drive a wagon, think of a wagon, narrow, narrow wheel with a metal rim, perhaps, if, that was, if they had gone that far. What that did when it hit soft ground, basically it stopped. And so one interesting thing you're going to find in your histories is that if you, if you do trace the, the migration of your people, that most of the migration took place in the middle of the winter because the ground was frozen and it was easier to move. In addition, these people usually had to make their living by growing crops. You don't grow crops in the winter, so you move. And when you get to the new place, you immediately start planting crops so that by the time the summer is through, you have enough food to survive another winter. So these were uh, kind of the the seasonal way that this all occurred. But they started digging this canal in, eight, in 1817, and it first opened in 1825. It was, and still is, one of the marvelous uh, developments, both technological and physically created by uh, here in the United States. It is a wonder. And, and it's still interesting to drive along the Erie Canal and look at the at, at, and think about it as an artificial waterway. It is just really impressive. It is, uh, it is not, it's not even, and it's still used. Parts of the, of the Erie Canal are still used for commercial travel. It is not uh, something that was completely abandoned. So it's an interesting situation. Following that, uh, primarily in New York and in, uh, 
because of the way that the waterways worked, is they developed a vast canal system. So in addition to the Erie Canal, which ran across uh, in, over to uh, Lake Erie, Buffalo, the uh, uh, New York Canal System was developed, and this began the process. And if you, if you look at uh, settlement patterns, uh, particularly as you see how counties were formed, which is an indication of the increase in population of an area, you'll see that the counties begin forming in the east uh, very early when the original settlers came. And then between 1800 and 1830, and sometimes extending a little later to 1840, uh, this, these, some, most of these eastern states begin to fill up with counties from east to west. And so by the 1830s and into 1840, you're seeing counties all the way across Pennsylvania, New York, and, and uh, uh, some of the other, Virginia and some of the other uh, states. As people, uh, as roads were developed, as commerce was developed, as uh, communities were established, uh, the, the settlers became coming in and there was more su uh, structure, superstructure to support the population. And so the population expanded and came across. All of this, of course, occurred because of the vast numbers of immigrants who were coming from uh, Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, millions and millions of people who, who left Europe and uh, came to America uh, in, in vast waves of settlement. And uh, the population then pushed west and began to, uh, to fill in the western part of the country. But focusing on this, we have to understand that I'm talking about 1830. I'm not talking about 1630. I'm not talking about 1730. I'm talking about 1830, just 200 years later going on 250 years before there is any significant settlement. So these canal systems and the road systems that began to be constructed along the canals and with the canals and to connect to the canals opened up vast areas to settlement. Now we're gonna jump ahead even further and right here in Utah at the, at the moment, we happen to be celebrating uh, this particular event, which was the Transcontinental Railroad and the completion of the railroad system. Uh, the first railroad was chartered in 1827. Okay, so this, this is an interesting fact and uh, needs to be another area that needs to be um, explored because uh, what I was saying a moment ago about the time it took to travel a certain distance. Uh, the time it took to travel by foot, by horse, or by wagon uh, varied with conditions of the roads, uh, the time of the year, the weather, uh, all of those factors could uh, basically stop surface travel. But what began to be the case here is that uh, in, 1820, in the 1820s, beginning primarily with the commercialization of uh, the railroads by 1830, both in England and uh, in the British Isles, and also in, uh, here in America. The, uh, the, the concept of travel was beginning to go through a, a revolution. We call this the Industrial Revolution because uh, of the industry increase, dramatic increase in industrialization due to uh, availability of transportation and opening up of markets and making uh, and the driving factors of, of innovation and inventions and all sorts of things. And steam engine and the uh, invention of railroads and, and the standardization of those railroads. So the first railroad in America was chartered in 1827. It took about 40 years for that railroad system to extend completely across the United States. So this is a tremendous change. Um, my ancestors who uh, left uh, uh, the last outpost of uh, civilization in, uh, 
in Ohio, in uh, Iowa, uh, in 1847 and 1848-49, when they began coming across the uh, the continent to uh, what is now Utah, traveled and took them weeks, months. It was essentially about a two and a half month trip to 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 walk across the country uh, and uh, to to get to Utah. And that took a lot of preparation and had you had to keep alive and you had to have supplies and be able to survive a trip of that nature. The Transcontinental Railroad turned that into a trip of days. It became a day's trips. That opened up the entire Western part of the United States. There was a tremendous explosion of transportation. And, and you can't ignore these things. These are things, they're, they're factors that uh, influenced and affected your ancestors, if your ancestors lived in the United States, whether they lived on the East Coast and stayed in the East Coast for their whole lives and everybody, all your ancestors lived and died in Rhode Island or in uh, New York or Connecticut or whatever, it didn't matter. The Transcontinental Railroad affected them and may have affected other people of, the, of their descendants who picked up and left because it was easier now to leave. In my family's case, uh, the interesting thing was that they lived uh, along the, the one of the major railroads, which was the, uh, the southern, uh, southern route railroad through Arizona, northern part of Arizona. There were two railroads across Arizona. There was a southern ro route and then the more northerly route. And that was what saved them from starvation because basically they uh, were employed by the railroad to uh, to to where that enabled them to become established in what was otherwise a very difficult desert to live in at the time. So there's all sorts of effects that this uh, the railroads had on the system. Now today we have the uh, there's actually a, a, a website that I reference here, OpenRailwayMap.org, and it uh, it maps all the all the existing and historical railroads. So what you have is a, is a web of railroads across the United States that created um, the, uh, uh, what we have today. If, if you were to look carefully at Arizona and you see a, a little tiny dot there, if your eyes are better than mine, you can probably read it, uh, that says Phoenix, you'll see there's a railroad line north of there and there's a railroad line south of there and a north-south line. Well, guess what? Those are the only lines that are in Arizona that have any significance for railroads. So travel in Arizona is still rather limited compared to, uh, to many places in the country. Uh, here's zooming in at, at the kind of things uh, detailed. This map is detailed as to the actual names and existence of all these railroads. Now, if you were, a, if you, were a, a, you know, a thinking about genealogy at this point, why, what would you think about? Well, you would think about well, did my parents or, or ancestors live near a railroad? Did my ancestors work for the railroad? If they worked for the railroad, are there any records of, how, of when they worked and where they worked and who was in their family and everything? The answer to that is yes, there are lots of railroad records. You're not going to find them by doing searches in the large online geneal genealogy programs for the most part. Uh, you're not gonna get them in ancestry or family search or whatever. But they're out there and they're available and there are railroad sites that, that have the information and they can begin to connect you with all of the records that, that are usually sitting in, in uh, university uh, special collections and in uh, museums and other kinds of organizations across the country. Uh, so they are available and they are searchable. Uh, they just take a, a, a major degree, higher degree of effort than simply clicking and looking for a name on, on uh, one of the large websites. Of course, the westward expansion preceded the um, uh, building of the railroads, but the railroads followed the trails used by the pioneer people, the, the early settlers who crossed the country. So these were extremely valuable 
uh, things. The concept here that was created was uh, began clear back in the early days of the existence of, of people in America. And that is that they had what was called a manifest destiny, a, uh, uh, a God-given right to expand across the country and claim the land. Um, whether you agree with that or not, that was basic a motivating factor by the governments and the organizations. Here's an interesting fact. We do not know how many people crossed the plains. All the numbers about the numbers of people who used the Oregon Trail, the Mormon Trail, are all estimates. They really have no idea how many people actually, no, but there was no registry. You didn't have to call up the government and get permission to, to, uh, to, build, to get a wagon or ride a horse and go across the country. They, uh, once they, people understood that it was possible, they just left. And uh, if your ancestors are living along the, in the east, um, even in the central part of the country, uh, west of the east of the Mississippi River, and they suddenly disappear, and you cannot find them, and you this they are just who where in the world would these people be? You just might want to try Oregon or Washington State or California or any place in between, because they could have just packed up and left. Here are the major trail systems across the country. Uh, the Oregon Trail, of course, is the most, uh, the, probably the most well-known uh, of the routes, and the Mormon Trail, which paralleled the Oregon Trail until uh, it reached the area that we now call Utah, and then went south and uh, into uh, uh, the Salt Lake Valley. And so what we have here are two major routes, and then the southern route across the United States uh, the southern route was a combination of, of uh, trails that were put together and eventually created a, a path across the country in the south, which was also the basis for forming for uh, a railroads to come across. Um, and that southern route uh, that's known, as, known in part as the Mormon Battalion Trail was a, a group of uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that were commissioned by the army to, uh, to help uh, fight during the Spanish War. And in that case, uh, they were marched across the country in one of the largest, longest uh, infantry marches in history. And they um, uh, blazed a trail across the country that uh, became uh, a, one of the major uh, east-west travels particularly after uh, in 1849 when uh, gold was discovered in California and so many other hundreds and millions of people decided to move to California. Um, there are lots of other migrations. Uh, we call the, the original migration from 1620 to 1635 uh, and around in the early 1600s, the Great Migration. It's always been called that. Uh, that's historical name for it. But there's another great migration, a great migration that occurred uh, during uh, the, uh, the U.S. subsequent to the U.S. Civil War and even years later into the early 1900s. The, uh, the biggest, one of the most dramatic migrations was of those people who had African descent uh, many of whom were formerly enslaved people who moved north. And that is called the second great migration, or you can call it the third migration. There's really two, two waves of people right immediately after the Civil War, and then again uh, after uh, the collapse of the, of the system that we call the Jim Crow era, era where there was so many problems in the South and, and uh, so much persecution of the, of the uh, African Americans and they moved and they moved North in great numbers. Um, so we have another great movement. And if you are tracing your ancestry into this particular people, you probably need to be aware of it. So there were 6 million African Americans from the Southern States 
who moved to the northern states and California from 1916 to 1970. So that's another pattern you have to be aware of as, as these people moved in huge numbers uh, from, north, from south to north. Uh, then what happened? Well, we had, uh, beginning in the 1960s, a uh, resurgence of industrialization that began to occur in the South, primarily because of cheap labor uh, and because of weather conditions and uh, living conditions and availability of land that was becoming difficult to, to develop in the northeastern part of the United States and the northern states. And so uh, we had the, the return to the Sun Belt. So we had people leaving all of the northern states moving to the south. Uh, in my lifetime, uh, Phoenix, Arizona has grown from a uh, small community where I lived on the very edge of town and could ride my bicycle in 10 or 15 minutes out into the desert to a town uh, where there are uh, the major area of Phoenix is in a county called Maricopa County, which Maricopa County has more population than the entire state of Utah, for example. And uh, Phoenix is now uh, either the fifth or sixth largest state in the United States. So these things did not happen in a vacuum. Uh, they, this kind of pattern of movement is part of this whole, um, the whole, uh, what's happened historically. Genealogists who are unaware, who know nothing about history, who have no clue, as to what was happening at the time, beginning clear back with uh, original colonies and settlements from Europe, are people who generally end up not either getting people, putting their people in the wrong areas and matching by names and, uh, and having the wrong lines, or are people who simply cannot figure out where their family is or who they are or what happened to them. Obviously, there's a lot more difficulties than just that, but that is still one of the as I've said earlier, one of the major issues. Um, another thing that we can't ignore when we begin to think about the movement of people across the country are the Homestead Acts, which began in 1862. Um, I'm gonna go back to that. The, the dark green area on this map is are what are called state land states. That means that uh, at the time of the independence of the United States from, from England, or uh, later with the declaration of the independence of Texas from Mexico, these states claimed all of the lands, the colonies, the original colonies, claimed all of the lands within their borders uh, and subsequent expansions thereof like Kentucky and Tennessee and uh, a break off uh, with West Virginia uh, during the Civil War. So these, uh, these, these particular areas, uh, the land, the majority of the land is owned by the state or is private. Uh, the federal government owns very, very percentage-wise, very, very small percentages of lands in all of the dark green states. On the other hand, the other part of the country, all of that in, in brown that's shown, is land that was acquired by the United States after the United States became a country. And so these, these are federal land states. And in many of those states, the government owns the majority of the lands, uh, or originally owned the majority of the lands. And these Homestead Acts were uh, part of the, of the process of the United States of selling off the land they owned, which they had acquired, by purchase primarily from other European from European countries in the Louisiana Purchase and the, and other and the war with Mexico and all of those, either by purchase or by conquest. And um, as these areas were acquired, the, gov the federal government claimed ownership and then began selling it off in order to make money. So the government used this as a money-making proposition and an encouragement of people to move west, all part of manifest destiny, destiny obviously, and uh, the fact that uh, the land was available and developable, and also to, to absorb all of the immigration that they had. Um, I might, another side note here, 
we have to, today, uh, as I'm presenting this particular webinar, uh, we have some terrific uh, controversies going on about immigrants in the United States. It might be interesting for, for you to know, if you don't know this, that the first immigration law was passed in 1882. Before 1882, there were no immigration laws in the United States. Anybody who wanted to walk into the country could walk into the country. There were no limitations. You didn't have to do anything, just come in. Uh, so think about it. Uh, think about your ancestors who got here before that cutoff and before they started uh, uh, regulating immigration and what is happening today with people who, uh, who try to come into the country. Um, by the way, the information, uh, the Bureau of Land Management has a, a, a part of the government that's called the General Land Office, or GLO. The GLO is the agency that sold all of, these, all of this land that was granted through the Homestead Acts. There's a whole series of Homestead Acts. That's another subject for another webinar, which I think I've already given one on that subject. But anyway... The, um, uh, there is a whole series here, and there's a website called the BLM GLO. It's called glo.blm.gov, and uh, the General Land Office, if you just look for that on Google, you'll find it immediately, is a website that, that has uh, a database of all of these original homesteads. Um, I can't say that it's utterly complete, but it is uh, got uh, millions and millions of registered homesteads. And you simply go search by the, by the place your ancestors lived and their name and find out if your ancestors owned any homesteads. My great grandfather had two homestead parcels in uh, Arizona that he obtained in the 1900s. So uh, pretty, uh, pretty interesting how you can find that. You can actually get the uh, description of the property and in some, in most cases, not in all cases, but in a lot of cases, you can get an exact a copy of the land patent. And here's a copy of my great grandfather's land patent from 1927. So, what do we have next? Well, we're getting into kind of a what we would call the modern era. Those uh, anything, of course, that that happened during my lifetime has got to be modern. I'm, you know. Uh, even though I understand uh, from talking to some of my grandchildren that many of them, uh, uh, none of them were born, by the way, during any of this. So they're, as far as they're concerned, it's all ancient history, and, it, and I'm pretty ancient. But uh, this is not ancient history to me because I can remember this being done. This is the interstate highway system that began in 1916, and this is the route, route map, route map, there we go. Which part of the country am I really from? Of the Lincoln Highway. And uh, having driven the entire Lincoln Highway, <laughs> maybe not all of it. There's probably some parts I haven't driven, but I've probably driven most all of that Lincoln Highway. And some of the original Lincoln Highway and actually gotten out and looked at, taken pictures of some of the original brick parts of the, of the Lincoln Highway. Anyway, it was, it's an interesting highway. Uh, it's uh, obviously through some of the least scenic parts of the country because they had to go across places that were flat and easier, easily developed. So it follows, uh, approximately follows some of the uh, parts of the, uh, it's a freeway now, and it part, uh, parts of the country where uh, the original wagon roads were. It was originally 3,389 miles, but think about the impact of being able to drive completely across the United States on a paved road. And that was, uh, that was something that only began in uh, the early 1960s or 1900s. Uh, my, some of the, my grandparents who I had contact with could relate to me the first time that they saw a car come to their town, the first automobiles. So this was, uh, this was a big deal for a lot of people in our country. And now we have the interstate highway system. Um, 
which I have uh, exhaustively driven in the last year or so. So, uh, and going back and forth across the United States. That was created as recently as 1956 in the Federal Highway Act. And uh, now we have some interesting things, and these are just kind of background things to cover up, to cover what we need to cover in the last couple of seconds of this presentation. We do have what's called a national map. And it is, it is uh, rather difficult to find. It's on usgs.gov. Uh, don't try to go to usgs.gov and find it. It might be, you probably won't do it. Just search for national map and you will find that there is an amazing number of maps in amazingly different detail with a lot of information that you may never have known about. Another great place <clears throat> to go for historical maps is the David Rumsey map collection. And this is also something you can find by doing a search for, for David Rumsey, R-U-M-S-E-Y, and uh, you will find these maps to be extremely useful and helpful. Uh, I refer you also to Google Earth, which has an amazing amount of information about roads and towns and places on the world. And it's very helpful for finding and looking at, at various parts of the country. And also Wikipedia. Uh, if you need to know about a place, uh, put your place into Wikipedia. I would say almost every populated place by using Wikipedia. Okay, well that ends that presentation for the day. Thanks for watching. Uh, remember that this is a BYU Family History Library webinar and that you can view these webinars on the BYU Family History Library website or on the BYU Family History Library web, uh, YouTube channel and please uh, Continue to watch. Thanks for all you have been watching the webinars and the, the videos on the BYU site. And remember to subscribe and like the videos, do all that stuff so that we have a little bit more visibility. Thanks again for watching. Um, so we'll take just a few minutes um, so that James can see your questions and then we'll start the Q&A. Um, you can type your questions into the chat box and we'll all read those out and James can answer those. Okay, well, let's see. We have a couple of questions. Uh, I have Mills relatives leaving Pennsylvania in the late 1700s and arriving in Meade, Kentucky in 1800. Um, rec records are limited. Any suggestions? Uh, GLO is not going to help you uh, because the land office didn't start until 1862. Uh, Kentucky was not a uh, fed, federal land state. It was a state land state. Uh, what is going to help you to know is that if you are in the late 1700s, that Kentucky was part of uh, Virginia and the records are probably in Virginia, which is a good place to start looking for records before you start looking in Kentucky, especially at that time period. Um, uh, yes, uh, there's a, a reference here to Georgia passports. Uh, uh, kind of in an hour like that, that I have here, it's impossible to mention every land pr uh, promotional activity. Georgia, by the way, was in uh, Northern Florida were both uh, subject to a substantial uh, pro uh, promotional effort or land sales. Uh, they had what were called the Georgia land lo lotteries where they would uh, um, put land up at a ridiculously low price and allow people to bid on the land and uh, get large tracts of land. <laughs> Excuse me. And that would be, uh, uh, you should really get into the Georgia land lottery issue if your people were were in there. And also uh, moving west from Georgia was caused, uh, had a root cause of primarily the depletion of the land. Uh, the people were raising primarily cotton and tobacco, both of which exhausted the nitrogen in the soil. They did not use uh, crop rotation or anything. So when they ran out of, uh, when the 
the yields dropped, they moved west. And that's why we have a flood of people moving uh, from west through, from Georgia through all the way to Mississippi and into Texas. Um, yeah, um, I would on the on the Facebook page some of those maps uh, on present on the maps. Uh, you could reference the uh, presentation, but I would be I would be careful to look to see if I put a uh, an acknowledgement or a link on the maps. Anytime I find an item which is not in the public domain or is in Creative Commons or whatever, then I will reference uh, the attribution or whatever is necessary. Uh, if you look at some of these slides uh, subsequently when they're posted, you'll see there's uh, some of them that have attribution that's a down the entire slide, side of the slide. So uh, without attribution, I would be careful not to publish anything that was clearly not clearly in the public domain. Um, that's the only thing I can say. So if I don't have attribution for it, uh, I would still check online and see if, uh, if there's any other restrictions. I did not find any because I would not do it if I, if I found any attribution. What else? We got anything else going on? Looks like that's all the questions. Um, and this, um, on this, um, presentation under the description of the YouTube uh, post as well as the website. Um, all the links that uh, James mentioned during his presentation will be uh, attached to that. So if you need um, those links, they will be there um, and you can post those links uh, as well as this um, video on your Facebook page or your social media and that should be uh, perfectly fine. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for today. Um, and just a reminder, this presentation will be posted um, next week on Monday on our web um, on our website, <clears throat> on our YouTube channel. Um, links will be provided uh, to those posts on our Facebook and Twitter. Um, and next Thursday, um, I'm not entirely sure um, if we'll be having the webinar at the same time. There has been a little bit of rescheduling, but there will be um, a email coming uh, about those changes as well as um, that information will be updated on our website and um, our social media as well. So make sure to look, at, look out for that um, and join us for our next webinar. Um, I think that's everything. If you have any email, um, if you have any questions, go ahead and email at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu, and I'll get back to you uh, with that. Um, we hope to see you next time and have a wonderful day.